Okay, well, thank you very much to Matt and to Dimax team for inviting me. Um, my name's Mark Watson. I work at Netflix, mostly on our streaming client technologies and also on standardization. Um, I want to get one thing out of the way first. Some people may have seen that this happened recently. Um, this was finally published. This was one of the things I was uh, hired to do at Netflix more than seven, well, about seven years ago. So the fact that it took seven years to do and that it's finally done, maybe not great for my job security, but there's been a lot printed in the press about it and not all of it good and a lot of it we're not allowed to respond to. But um, I think one thing that I really want to emphasize here is the reason we did this was all about these guys. And we were able to migrate from Silverlight and other people have been able to migrate from Flash because of this. And so you can expect um, if your site is still using Flash or Silverlight, the browsers are going to be coming for you. You have no excuses left. It's time to abandon plugins and allow um, the browsers to deprecate them fully. So what I wanted to talk about today is a bunch of new things that we have going on. It's a really exciting time now to be in video engineering. And we have a bunch of new toys that we can play with. Um, Stephen from YouTube talked last year a little bit about high dynamic range and wide color gamma, and I want to go into a bit more detail about some of the things we're discovering and some of the problems we're discovering with those technologies, um, exciting things for us to try and solve. And we also have a bunch of new video codecs. So the Alliance for Open Media should publish the uh, AV1 video codec um, before, before the, well, at the end of the year. We also expect to have a new image format based on that, um, which we are going to call AVIF. And then um, for those who like royalty uncertainty, there's also HEVC and the uh, HEIF that can uh, have similar performance or, or not, not quite as good as AV1. So I want to talk about these uh, new, new technologies. Um, a little bit about the Alliance for Open Media first. So this has not been only a technical exercise to develop a new video codec. It's also been quite an involved legal exercise. So royalty-free, which is where we hope the codec will be, does not mean patent-free. So we have 30 mem more than 30 member companies in the Alliance for Open Media, and they will be dedicating their IP portfolio, such as it's relevant, to, uh, to this codec and enabling people to use that um, royalty-free. And we also have conducted a lot of uh, legal review to try and make sure that there's very low risk on this codec. And the final thing that's important about the licensing model for the AV1 codec is that uh, when you use the license to actually make use of AV1, you also grant back any uh, rights that your company may have to all the other users of AV1. So this kind of spreads like a viral thing. Everyone um, who's out there has a choice that they can either use the codec or they can just not use it at all. Um, and if they use it, then they contribute to the pool of rights that, uh, that support it and reduce the royalty risk. So as I say, we also expect to define an image format a little bit like HEIF, but focus more on dis image distribution, uh, not so much on the capture side. So something very simple, just use the iframes from the AV1 video codec and uh, allow those to be used to, uh, to distribute still, still, image, still images as well. So this is a bunch of the new toys that we, uh, that we have to play with. The other thing that we see happening um, at Netflix, somewhat independently, is a great deal of innovation on user interfaces and discovery experiences that, uh, um, that our team on the user interface side are inventing. And this is driven by improvements in device performance, um, especially on TV side. Um, we start seeing GPUs on devices, TV devices now, which enable a whole bunch of, sort of them to do new and exciting things with that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about where uh, video discovery experiences are going. And we'll get back to the, the new tools and um, new toys in a, in a moment or two. So here is uh, where we came from. Obviously, this is not Netflix, but back in the day, it's a kind of choose, click, watch experience. And uh, there's no tyranny of choice here. Um, this is your entire universe. Your, as a user, your um, job is to make a decision between this handful of things. And you pretty much know that there's nothing else on offer. So there's no uh, FOMO there. Um, you just got to choose one of these things. When we get to services like Netflix, when we first started, then um, you can enhance that. There's obviously a much bigger universe of things to choose from, and we rely on recommender systems to try and show people the things that we think that they will want to see. And we make the experience more visually interesting with images rather than simply text descriptions. Um, and we've even discovered um, more recently that the images that work best for a given bit of content can vary from market to market, actually improve the um, uh, take up by optimizing exactly which image you use. So this is a huge improvement over what was had before. It's still pretty basic. It's still just a little um, list of things um, with only an image for you to try and decide what you want to do. So you know, no matter how good the recommendation systems are, at the end, uh, a human being has to make an actual decision about what they're going to watch. 
And human beings generally, although this approach is getting less popular in the public sphere, generally need evidence on which to make decisions. And here in this user interface, the main evolution is that we add a bunch more evidence to the thing that's currently highlighted, that together with us trying to show them things that they might want to watch in the first place, allows them to try and make a better decision about whether this is going to be something that they're going to enjoy. So here you have um, a, bunch, uh, a much bigger image that can show you more about what the show is going to be like, and so on. So the obvious next step, if what I'm trying to do is uh, give the user evidence about whether they want to watch a particular video, the obvious missing thing here is video. There's no video in that evidence that might help them understand what they want to watch. And so the next sort of evolution of our user experience sometime last year was to include video playback in the uh, browsing experience so that as you're moving around, then it's constantly showing you videos. And if people can make a better decision about what they're going to watch, then you know, they're more likely to enjoy the service and more likely to continue to subscribe to it. OK, back to the new toys. Um, to talk a little bit about high dynamic range and wide color gamut and um, what those things mean for uh, video and for those user, experience, uh, user experiences that we're designing. So I, I guess many people here are probably familiar with high dynamic range, just the basic background. This is a completely simulated, faked up image, but this image has a lot of dynamic range in the original scene. There are bright areas and there are dark areas. Um, but I've kind of compressed it a little bit so that it sort of looks a bit gray and dull. If you are able to do that in a high dynamic range, you would see a much uh, bigger range of brightness. Um, you're much more detail in the dark areas. And it generally looks a lot better. So in my experience, this is kind of the transition to high dynamic range is rather like the transition was from SD to HD. You go from seeing things which looked like a sort of plane of moving pictures into something that looks more like a window onto a, a more realistic looking um, view. And that change is it's much more significant visually than the change from HD to 4K. Um, it depends a lot on how well the content is authored to take advantage of these new things, but it really could be sort of transformative in terms of the user experience and how immersive and, um, and realistic the images look. So we also have a bunch of new colors. Um, the, color range of traditional so standard dynamic range TV is somewhat limited to G709 color space. And that displays have for a while been able to um, render a much wider range of colors. So you can get essentially deeper, um, less uh, more saturated colors. You can get the uh, actual color of a London bus, which is outside of the G709 range. So you've probably never, and this is not an image of accurate image of a London bus. It's really not that color. Um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to display the true color of objects in the world on uh, consumer displays. So what is the basic technical change? You know, I've got a few minutes into this presentation and we haven't had any graphs yet. This is obviously wrong for um, DMARC's conference. So what is the basic technical um, change that's behind um, high dynamic range? So fundamentally, you're trying to render pixels on the screen. You've encoded them digitally. You have some numbers. You need to map those pixel values into a luminance um, for the pixel on the screen. And traditionally, we would use a gamma curve for this. It's the gamma 2.4 curve there. Um, goes from about 0.01 nits, nits the measure of luminance, up to 100 nits, and um, you know, maps from code values. This is imagining a 10-bit code value scale. Maps from code values to pixel luminance. So the simplest thing we can do is just use a different curve, and this is a curve called PQ, perceptual quantizer, um, that has a wider range. And so maps from those code values to this uh, wider range of luminances. And the PQ curve goes all the way up to 10,000 nits, which is way brighter than any consumer display. It's actually way brighter than um, the reference monitors that people are using. Um, but it's still not like, incredibly bright. It's, uh, I think, a sort of a bright um, fluorescent lamp can get to that bright. So that's, that's one approach is to use the PQ curve. Another approach which people are using is called hybrid log gamma. And this, again, is just a different curve that maps from pixel values to, code, to uh, luminances. And the difference with hybrid log gamma is that it's designed to uh, match the uh, gamma curve along a certain amount of the range there. So if you take something that's coded in hybrid log gamma and you give it to a display that knows nothing about hybrid log gamma, it's not going to do a terrible job. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but it's still going to render a, an image which is rec recognizable. This is particularly useful for broadcast chains where you don't necessarily want to upgrade every single component and test monitor and so on in the, um, in the broadcast chain. But there is a compromise involved here. You don't have as, uh, as great a uh, output brightness range, and um, you don't have uh, as accuracy down at the lower end that you have with the PQ. 
So why do we need a new curve at all? This is an immediate question. Why not just uh, do this with uh, the existing gamma curve and extend it to a broader range? So this graph is kind of a bit busy, but may I can ex this explains why. And I can talk through the, uh, the different things we have on this graph. So what this one is showing you, um, luminance on the x-axis ranging from the 0.001 up to 10,000. 10, the y-axis is a little bit tricky. The y-axis is the difference between the luminance of adjacent code points for a given curve. So for any given coding curve that maps from code points to luminance, I can take two adjacent code points. I can say, well, are these 1% difference or these 10% difference? And so depending on where you are on the luminance scale, these different curves have a different um, difference between adjacent uh, code points. And obviously what we want to achieve is something where a human can't really tell the difference between those adjacent code points. That it's, a, it's just below the just noticeable difference um, and not too far below it. So if we are to have these adjacent code points somewhere where people can really tell a difference, then our image is going to have banding or other artifacts where something that should be a smooth uh, contrast um, is looking, has banding in there. If we code things where that difference is completely unnoticeable, sort of way below human perception, we're wasting bits. We're encoding information that you can't see. So the dotted lines, the purple and blue lines in this graph, are two different approximations of human visual sensitivity to contrast. And our sensitivity to contrast varies in the luminance range. So up at those high luminance levels, um, then there's some evidence that humans can tell a 1% difference in luminance. But down at the low levels, then, there's evidence that you, you can't even see a 10% difference in the, um, in the contrast levels. So our ideal curve would follow those dotted lines. And you can see the PQ curve um, uh, with 10 bits, whether you do a PQ curve extending to 1,000 or to 10,000, are both getting close to that Barton threshold and are below the Schreiber threshold, which is the other um, approximation. The red curve here is the standard gamma curve um, from like recommendation 1886. And extending up to one, if you extend that gamma curve up to 1,000 nits with 10 bits, even if you sort of do those extensions from um, the existing sort of standard SDR, then it still goes uh, way above the Schreiber threshold for a big chunk of the luminance range. And so that's why we essentially need to move to a different curve um, that is going to not waste bits, but also uh, stay within what we can uh, what we can see. So those curves went up to 10,000 nits. What do real displays go up to? Well, obviously, it's completely uh, uh, a complete range of capabilities for real consumer televisions. Um, but the UHD Alliance defined this Ultra HD Premium logo, which, although the logo itself is not getting a great deal of use at the moment, it at least sets a kind of bar for what um, a bunch of people in that group, including uh, content providers, TV manufacturers, and distributors, all agreed was a sort of genuine HDR experience, something where majority of consumers would really say that um, this is a significant improvement on SDR. It's actually defined two different sets depending on whether you have a very high contrast display like an OLED one, um, where the, the high contrast and the really deep blacks mean that you can get a really good experience even if your luminance isn't, um, isn't uh, super high, so they go up to 560 nits. And on the LED side then, um, displays typically can go up to 1,000 or higher, but the contrast isn't as good on LED technology. So you just find these two different things, both of them give you know, subjectively similar results when you do subjective testing. So we have this problem um, that we have uh, our content. Content has typically been created on monitors that go up to two or 4,000 nits. Um, and we have this PQ curve that goes all the way up to 10,000. And then we have displays that go nowhere near that. So what should we do? I mean, ideally, what you would like to see is if you look at the signal um, measured in nits on the x-axis versus what is displayed, this is what you would like to see. You would like to see the display render exactly what was, uh, what was intended and what's in the signal. And of course, we can't do that. And the simplest thing you would think to do um, if you, uh, uh, without sort of thinking about it carefully is just to clip at the display capability. So suppose my display is going up to 1,000. Anything above 1,000, I'm just going to render it at the um, brightest level. So this is going to give you an image that looks overexposed. The bright areas are going to be blown out. Um, just everything is sort of clipped up there. To make this work properly, we need to um, create some kind of curve that will smoothly map from the input signal to the display capability. Um, and uh, we call this a tone mapping curve. So really, the, the entirety of the dark art of HDR video is about tone mapping. And tone mapping is kind of the root of uh, many of the problems that we see in HDR video. And getting it right is one of the key things that's going to make uh, HDR a really good experience on, on real consumer displays and not just on the high-end reference displays.
So if you want to imagine that, uh, we'll zoom in on that graph a little bit there, and imagine that we have a piece of content that is sort of pretty bright generally. Um, it's actually Chef's Table France that is in HDR, not Chef's Table. But um, I have a piece of content. It's quite bright. This is going to work as well as it can. The content contains all of these uh, different levels of luminance, and we are mapping them to the best the display can do. But what if I have a different piece of content that is a much darker look to that piece of content? Um, if I render that using the same curve, the peak brights in that content that maybe are only, and this is just for illustration, but maybe there are only 1,000 nits, are going to be mapped to a much lower value than the display capability. So we're wasting that high end of the display capability. And that's the expensive part of the display that got it up to those peak brightnesses. With this piece of content, we could have um, rendered it pretty faithfully to what was uh, originally seen. So what we really want to do is use a different curve that will um, make much better use of the entire display capability. This is going to make a big difference to how different pieces of content that have different looks appear on consumer displays. And there's a real opportunity to make those pieces where, where we can to be as faithful as possible to the original intent for the content. So the question now is, how am I going to decide? I'm a display. How should I decide which of these two curves to use or what the right curve to use is? And this is where we get to the topic of uh, HDR metadata. So some displays actually think that they can work this out for themselves. They'll just do real-time analysis of the content and, and do, the, do the right thing. Um, it's not clear how well that's going to work. So instead, at the moment, we have this very simple HDR metadata. It's just, it just tells you about a property of the content. What is the peak light level that occurs in this piece of content? And what is the sort of average or the brightest frames that occurs in the piece of content? And using that information, a device can choose a good tone mapping curve to use that will match well with this piece of content and, and render it well. So uh, is this good enough? Um, you can totally imagine that these values will vary from one piece of content to another. But you know, why stop there? Of course, these values are going to vary from one scene to another within a single piece of content. So a single piece of content may well have scenes that can be rendered perfectly, and others where you need to apply tone mapping. So this is where we get to the topic of dynamic metadata. And so this is now a sort of new SMPTE standard, 2094, that defines a way that we can uh, attach metadata to be used for tone mapping to individual scenes or even individual frames. So this is a standard now. And the best thing about standards is there are so many uh, to choose from. This particular standard doubles down on that. Uh, there are so many within the same standard to choose from. Um, so the same standard has four completely independent ways of doing this that came from these four companies. Um, they all have a bunch of things in common, but um, you, you're going to need to choose which one of these you want to support, or you can support multiple of them because the actual volume of the metadata is not high. But we'll see it play out over the next few years, I think, um, which of these gains the most traction. So they all do a very similar thing, and it's somewhat different from the um, properties of the content metadata that uh, I talked about before. They all define uh, color volume transform. So I haven't talked much about color, but essentially the same problem applies to color. Um, as applies to luminance, we have a, a range that is in the source material that is wider than the display capability, and you want to try and uh, shrink that in without give, causing artifacts, um, but whilst, whilst being faithful to the original colors uh, to the largest extent that you can. But this one is a different model. Instead of uh, the, providing the metadata, it actually provides the transforms that can be applied to specific frames or specific scenes. It can provide multiple different transforms targeting different sets of device capabilities. So if you want to, you could actually design to a particular device capability and see how that's going to look before you ship the content. And it actually also has things that will um, apply this to specific regions of the image, although I'm not sure if anyone's likely to support that. You can carry this information over. Uh, HEVC and, uh, and HDMI and so on. So I don't know how the multiple formats is going to play out. The real battle is more on the content production side, because the first thing you have to do is persuade someone to actually produce this metadata and include it with their content. And there's a bunch of questions around tooling there and around uh, additional creative effort that would be needed to create some of these metadata formats. So I think that's the real battle is in the production of the metadata in the first place. Once it's available, then um, and where, where whichever one becomes most available is more likely that people will support that on the receiving end. So how does all that techie stuff and problems with tone mapping and so on relate to the other piece I talked about, which is the new user interfaces and the new experiences that people are developing? So increasingly, people on the design side 
they are excited by these new tools as well, and the possibility of having high dynamic range video and high dynamic range images. And there's no reason on the application design, user interface design, to think that, there's, that I shouldn't combine all these things and mix and match and do whatever I, I would like to do. So we can easily imagine that we're going to have user experiences soon where there's video playing possibly more than one video at a time. There are images all over the screen at the same time as the video is playing. There's alpha blending between images and video. Um, there's SDR images and there's HDR images. And you know, people are combining these in creative ways. So how would we like that to work technically? Each of those individual sources, whether they're from video playing simultaneously or video sequentially, have different metadata. And the graphics, too, have different metadata. And these things need to be composited. But before we can composite them, we have to apply the appropriate tone mapping for each one. So this is the, um, this is the architecture that we'd really like to see, where these things are tone mapped individually and then composited. The tone mapping requires information about the target display capability. So we store whatever you're, that's what you're trying to map to. So this can work fine. Um, if you have an integrated display, everything's inside one device, then there's no sort of technical reason, aside from the amount of silicon you would need, um, to be able to do this on the, on the display. But we have a big problem when you're plugging something in over HDMI. So for the Netflix service, we have a good mix between people who are watching with the Netflix app built into their TV and people that are watching on devices that are plugged into the TV. I think there's going to be an increasing number, especially as we look at sort of expand around the world and into other markets, where it's, it's those devices that are plugged into the TV. And those streaming sticks are very uh, performant now and extremely cheap. And the, in the TV market, the price pressure is all on the quality of the panel. So you can really see that the, um, having these as separate components and maybe you upgrade your streaming stick more often than your panel um, makes sense to have these things separate. So it's not going to just go away and everything is going to be integrated. We have this problem with HDMI. And the reason that it's a problem, well, so the reason it's a problem is that uh, we needed that target display capability information. And as soon as there's an HDMI link in the way, we didn't have that anymore. Um, there is some stuff for capability to be passed back in HDMI, but it's not reliable. And um, TV manufacturers think of their capability information as proprietary, um, competitively sensitive information. And so it's unlikely that it's going to become reliable to have that transmitted back over HDMI. So this is what actually happens in practice. Um, the tone mapping has to happen on the target display side, and um, it has to be done. You, know, you don't really have any good choices about how to make this work. Um, you composite on the source side, and you send the metadata for whatever you think is the most important of the sources. And the problem this is going to cause is that as we're switching from one video to another, um, or we're moving graphics around the screen, we're applying tone mapping, the same tone mapping to everything. It's the right tone mapping for one of my sources, but it's wrong for all the others. And so you can expect to see a p changes in appearance of the graphics. And the simplest example is an HDR video, sequence of HDR videos with some H SDR graphics on the screen at the same time. You can expect to see those graphics appearance change each time the video changes. And this is going to look like a bug to users. There's a further issue when we start about mixing um, HDR and SDR. So if I have... Um, you know, SDR graphics, and I'm rendering them onto, or SDR video even, rendering it onto an HDR display, there's effectively no standard for exactly how you should do this. I mean, you might think that you would just do that and map the 100 nits to 100 nits on the display, but nobody does that, and no one has done that for years. And uh, in fact, the mapping of SDR video onto displays that have uh, a greater capability is uh, a big um, area where there's been a lot of innovation on the TV side, and you have a variety of different picture modes that people have invented. And they feel that those are competitive differentiators as well, that they've designed those uh, mappings um, based on what they, their perception of user preferences. So you know, everyone's mapping it to some higher number, and there's no standard for what that should be. It's not even clear that it, there should be a fixed number for that. that um, it seems there's plenty of evidence that there should be some creative control over exactly what that um, SDR images or graphics gets mapped to in the context of an HDR display where it's being composited with other things. So it's obviously not correct also to map it to the peak white of the display. So you're going to have sort of blindingly bright subtitles um, and so on. The, another way to think about this is that um, if you think about uh, integrated displays on laptops, then you know, what was the peak white of the 
graphics or an SDR display, it was whatever the user set it to with the brightness control. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the white, white uh, page was displayed there, and if it was too bright, they just turned the brightness down. So this isn't right for HDR anymore, because you want to use that headroom above what is a comfortable white background for the highlights and the specular highlights in HDR uh, video and images. So we really have a sort of unsolved problem here. What should that number be? How can we get creative control of it or programmatic control of that mapping? Um, to make sure you get the sort of right result and you, you use all the capabilities of the display. So this is a good time for a quick sidebar about uh, creative intent. So I've talked a little bit about being faithful to what people intended. What does that really mean when we talk about creative intent? For this is most for um, well, I was going to say professionally produced content, but all producers have some intention about how they want their content to look. Um, so we define creative intent as the look of the content. Um, that the producer or the director or the colorist wishes to convey to the end user. And we strictly say that that is established in a grading suite when they're sitting there looking at a reference monitor and they sign off and say, oh, this is, this is how I want it to look. And it's dependent on multiple things. It's dependent, obviously, on what is actually displayed on that reference monitor, the actual pixel intensities that were emitted there, and on the resolutions and the frame rates. It's also dependent on the ambient light in that, uh, in that environment, because the look of something depends on the, the brightness of things around it. So I think many people have seen this one. Um, the squares A and B, clearly different colors there, um, but actually not. They're the same colors. They just look different because of the surrounding colors. And if creative intent is how things look, then the creative intent of this image was that these things should look different. It depended on the ambient light. So HDR, we have a new opportunity. In SDR, content was graded up to 100 nits, and all the displays had greater capability than that, and all bets were off about what the displays would do with that. And we have a new opportunity with HDR to try and return to more faithfully reproducing what was intended. And ambient light is an important component of that. It's not an easy one, but it's certainly something that needs to be considered, um, unless we, otherwise we're just going to get feedback from consumers that this doesn't look good, this looks too dark, or it's too bright, or whatever. So going back to the um, problem with HDMI that I mentioned earlier, we have our different sources. They really need different tone mapping. Um, and uh, we end up having to do that just a single tone mapping on the destination side. If we take the two principles that the destination device is the one that's best placed to do the tone mapping, and we also take the principle that we need to do the tone mapping separately for each source, we don't have any alternative apart from to go to this, which is to send those different components independently across HDMI. So, this is something that would have been kind of impossible with HDMI as it was in like 2.0 and before. Um, I don't know, people probably know a little bit about HDMI, but you look at that, it's, it was a very kind of synchronous, um, like had lines and blanking intervals and uh, vertical and horizontal blanking as if it was like timed to the movement of a cathode ray over a screen or something like really strange like that. Um, they've changed that recently. Um, it's now more, it's not entirely, but it's more kind of packet oriented. The clock on the link is, can be fixed, and you can switch resolutions and bit depths and other things without having to resynchronize the clock, which in itself is a big improvement. Um, and if there's sort of gaps in your, um, in your transmission, that's fine. So that allows you to do, would allow you to do things like this in principle. It's not in the HDMI 2.1 spec, but we're talking to the HDMI forum about um, how to evolve HDMI further so that it can really solve this problem, enable people to do the right thing on the right part in the system for these new experiences that are mixing all these things together. So, summarize, we have this uh, new canvas, we have more colors, um, we have a uh, higher dynamic range, and these lead to the need for um, metadata and tone mapping uh, to actually get that to look good on the displays. On the other hand, we have uh, increasing innovation in the user experiences that people want to develop, and mixing video and graphics and so on to help people find the right things to choose. The user interface innovation isn't an ancillary thing. It's not just a kind of bells and whistles or sort of fun and polish on the user experience. It's essential to any sort of video uh, service that has a large catalog um, to be able to guide users to the right to think the right things to watch. And if a user spends, you know, have this, we have this tiny window. We have a tiny window of the screen to show them things, and we have a tiny window of attention in which people want to actually choose something to watch. So unless we can guide them to the right thing in those tiny windows, the whole service has failed. It doesn't matter how great all the other content is that they didn't find. 
or if they actually choose something that is the wrong thing for that user, then that's going to put them off the service, and um, it's sort of fundamental to the success of any kind of video-based, or any video service that has a large catalog. So these two things are coming together, uh, more realistic and engaging images and video on the one side, and more engaging and, um, and complex user interfaces on the other side. And those things are not matching right now. Um, the tone mapping problem is not straightforward to solve, and I think it's one of the most challenging and interesting problems uh, as we go forward with uh, video, video engineering. You know, how do we bring these two things together? How do we make sure that the people on the design side have the freedom that they want to design these great experiences, and on the uh, content side, we can make use of the new tools that we have. And um, that's most of what I have to say. The future is very bright. Doesn't that? It looks even brighter just because of the picture of the sun. It's actually I don't know, not very bright at all in this image. OK, so that's, that's what I had to cover. I hope it was uh, interesting. I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have. Yeah.